welcome back to Rebels Off the Hill political panel. I'm Robin Brown, co-host of tonight's panel, and I'm joining you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. And I'm joined tonight by my co-host, Libby Davies. Well, thanks, Robin. Hello, everybody. I'm Libby Davies, your co-host for this month's Off the Oh, I think Libby got cut off there. She will come back and join us. Um, this month, we're digging into the recent wins and challenges of the labor movement in Canada. And as always, we have gathered a powerhouse panel to offer their expert opinions. First, welcome to New Democratic MP, Alexander Bolaris. Hi, Alexander. Alexander has been the NDP member of parliament for a Rosemont Le Petit Patrie in Montreal for 12 years. Alexander is the NDP deputy leader and labor critic and is currently leading the fight for the adoption of a bill to ban replacement workers or scabs at the federal level. Welcome, Alexander. Good to have you. Uh, next, Thanks. we have Laura Walden. Laura was elected uh, president of the Ontario School Board Council of Unions in 2019, having first served as its vice president. Before that, she was president of the Canadian Union of Public Employees Local 1022, which represents education workers at Hastings and Prince Edward County District School Board. Welcome, Laura. Good to have you. Uh, also joining us uh, tonight is Shuka Jekum. Shuka is a writer and policy researcher. His work focuses on inequity and inequality, drug policy, structural racism, and labor. He's also a columnist for Rabble and a regular pa panelist on Off the Hill. Uh, welcome back, Shuka. And rounding out our panel tonight is Carl Nuremberg. Carl is an award-winning journalist, broadcaster, and filmmaker working in both English and French. He is Ravel's senior parliamentary correspondent and a regular panelist on the Hill. Welcome, Carl. Hi. Uh, so what, welcome to all of our panelists tonight, and a special welcome to all, to all who are watching on Zoom. We encourage you to participate in the chat and polls and ask questions to our panelists through the Q&A function. And we'll do our best, as always, to address your questions. For those of you watching on Facebook, a reminder that if you'd like to participate in future events, simply sign up for Ravel's free newsletter to get a notification uh, for the Zoom invite. Just go to ravel.ca slash subscribe. Well, thanks, Robin. And for longtime readers of Rabble, you'll know that the labor beat is a critical element of Rabble's journalism, something which is often ignored or maligned by the mainstream in today's media. Today on our panel, we're delighted to dive into recent developments on the labor front. And as you can imagine, that's a big subject to tackle. So let's jump right in. Uh, I'm gonna begin with you, Alexandre. And again, thank you so much for joining us because we know how busy it is in Ottawa and Parliament. So it's great that you're here tonight. Alexandre, you've had yourself a very rich and active history within the labor movement. And now you're the key spokesperson for the NDP on labor issues. Um, the Canadian Labour Congress has just concluded their national convention in Montreal, and we recently saw an historic national strike action taken in the public sector. So I'd like to get your initial thoughts on the state of labour these days uh, for you to talk about what are the current challenges that you see and if you can give us a quick update on your work to bring in anti-scab anti -scab legislation, that would be great too. So take it away, <laughs> Alexander. Thank, thanks, Libby. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm so happy to be uh, here with you uh, all. And uh, you know, uh, it, it was it was a few just a few questions, but big questions. Uh, yep. How long do I have? Uh, two hours, three hours? No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, it's it's really interesting what's happening right now with the labor movement and we saw like um a new generation taking uh taking care of the movement and leading the movement and uh we see that at, at the clc in quebec at the csn and uh, ftq which is a quebec federation of labor with the new president the first woman and indigenous women um now is the president of the uh, of the qfl or ftq so that we can see, and with the PSAC uh, strike, the, you know, the most, uh, uh, you know, the biggest strike against one employer in the history of Canada. It's not nothing. And uh, I saw people in Montreal and in Ottawa, you know, uh, on, on picket lines with a lot of, of 
energy and trust and hope. And, and I think that we are, we are at a pivotal uh, time also because of the shortage of, of uh, workers on the, on the uh, work market. So it's interesting because, you know, there's, there's a new balance and there's a, uh, a, a the position that is uh, advantageous for, for the workers and their, their, the organization, but there's also a, a lot of, of challenges. Uh, you know, the labor is the unions are not there with uh, high tech uh, jobs, uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, video games. Uh, it's difficult in those se those sectors. Uh, a lot of freelancers are not real freelancers. They have only one employer, and they are kind of uh, exploited um, uh, workers that are not organized. So I think the challenges, from my point of view, is also to organize the non-organized right now. And uh, but we see good good stories with Amazon. You know, with young workers that want to uh, to make a change and 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 defend their rights so um and and what and another uh, uh challenge is the the migrant migrant workers like uh, uh 500 000 of them are now working in canada and they have no status and no rights at all mm -hmm. and it's difficult to organize them but they are there and they are part of our economy and we have to um address that issue and and to to make to uh, create new ways to uh to uh, make sure that we will uh, give them a status and make make sure that they have the right to or, to organize. So I think that those those are the, the challenges that the labor uh, movement have uh, right now. And um, I, I can go political maybe a little bit later about the uh, you know the polls and the, the opinions of of uh, unionized workers. But uh, if you ask me about the um, Anti-scab legislation is one of the 27 items we negotiated with the minority liberal government. It's one of it is very important because the liberals have always refused, and you know that Libby, to yes, vote in favor. Yeah, to vote in favor in, in the parliament. So the we we uh, we have succeeded to twist their arm and to put that in the 12, 27 uh, uh, items accord that we have. Um, now um, they are dragging their feet a little bit. But they are liberal, so that we need to continue to to push and to put pressure on, on them. But I'm I'm quite hopeful that at the beginning of the fall we will see a text and a legislation uh, table in the House of Commons. Well, thank you for that great overview. Oh, I think Libby's having some internet issues. I'm sure he's going. She was going to say thank you, Alexander, for that great overview. <laughs> And um, I think legislation might get through after oh. so many tries over many yeah. years. Um, and again, she's having some issues, but you guys can all. Yeah, yeah me... sorry. I, I think I was not. I was I was muted. My own fault. I, I was just saying thank you to Alexander for a great overview. And I'm really glad to hear that the anti-scab legislation finally might make it through the House of Commons because it's been well, a very long time in coming. Um, so now it's a great segue over to Laura, um, just to sort of pick up this question. Laura, as the president of the Ontario School Board Council of Unions, representing 55,000 education workers who are member of QP, uh, how are you seeing the key issues? Like, what do you have your eye on on the provincial scene there in Ontario? Because it's been very active there too. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think coming off of the fall where we saw 55,000 education workers walk off the job illegally um, to protest Doug Ford's uh, anti-worker bill, um, you know, that used the notwithstanding clause to interrupt the freely negotiated process. Um, I think the labor movement in Ontario and in fact across the country seems to be on, in this momentum that is really exciting. And for those of us who have spent some time in the labor movement, um, you know, I think we've been waiting for this to happen. You know, it's it's been a coming together of sorts. And it's interesting because the issues that Alexandra raised are some of the same things that I'm having my eye on. Um, I think, first of all, the internal organizing that we're seeing within unions, unions, you know, now 
recognizing that our power in unions and in the labor movement stems from the workers uh, and having that open transparency with workers, centering workers in these fights um, is super keen and really important for us to be moving forward. Uh, and you know that was a bit of the secret to our success was centering the workers in the fight, having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, I think building upon that internal organizing is the organizing of new workers. Um, you know, we mentioned Amazon, but also Starbucks. We just recently had our first Starbucks in Ontario become unionized. Uh, we've seen many of them out West. Um, the steel workers are, are very uh, much in that, making that happen, which is exactly what we need. Um, you know, looking for alternate places where these workers are not organized. And I think the migrant workers are another area where we need to have steps in place and be talking to them and providing them because we know as workers, our strength is when we come together in a union. And then I think the third piece that is really super exciting for me is the joining of labor with the community. Organizing doesn't stop at the doorstep of the union hall. Organizing must include our communities, and that includes our faith groups. It includes our, you know, extracurricular activities. It includes, you know, different places in where organizing typically has not been done or where labor has not been welcomed. Um, you know, and I just recently had the opportunity to be speaking at the Ukrainian Labor Temple in uh, Winnipeg, you know, where they were the heart of where the RCMP stormed them uh, during the, you know, general strike of 1919. And it really hit me. That was the secret behind, you know, the 1919 strike was we didn't stop talking just at the hall, we moved it out into the community. And what I'm seeing in Ontario with the Ontario Federation of Labor, um, you know, with the Enough is Enough campaign, and I'm also seeing it, you know, across this country where labor is recognizing we need to be in the community and we need to be lifting up these community issues because workers' issues are community issues and community issues are worker issues. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and just a, a quick follow up from that, Laura, um, you, you did a recent interview with rabble.ca and you said the possibility of a general strike could, quote, be on the horizon, which I think is intriguing and uh, <laughs> exciting. And so just wondering if you could elaborate on your thoughts on that. Well, in Ontario in November, we were on the cusp of a general strike. Uh, you saw in November, on November 7th, the coming together of both private and public sector unions, community members, when Doug Ford had attacked education workers in Ontario, had used the notwithstanding clause to jam through uh, an imposed collective agreement and rip away our right to strike and our right to freely negotiate. Um, and it was that coming together of labor that forced the government that was newly elected with a majority, again, to actually step back repeal their law within two days, um, which was, you know, a remarkable feat. It hasn't been done in recent time. And, and I'm extremely proud of the workers that came together to make that happen. Uh, OPSU joined our lines um, as well. Like it was a real coming together. You saw Unifor, you saw steel workers coming together and, and being ready and on the cusp and recognizing that this may be what we need to do. And I will say this time and time again, you know, the, the environment, the conditions are right to happen, but it takes a lot of work. And I believe that there will be a general strike, but it's not going to be led by leaders. It's going to be demanded by workers that have had enough of corporations and of governments and are saying, take your foot off our throats. We are done. Our labor has value and we're speaking up about it. Uh, and I think what you're starting to see is this organic coming together of workers across sectors, across, you know, private and public. Um, you know, I often say it doesn't matter what flag you fly. It doesn't matter what job you work in. All labor has value. And when we come together under that mantra, uh, that's when you'll see real change happen. And I do believe uh, that that may be in the form of a general strike. It's going to take a heck of a lot of work to get there. Uh, but it's something that I'm in, you know, to work with everyone to make sure that happens and that workers are recognized, not just in Ontario, uh, but, you know, not just in our in Canada, but globally as well. And I think you're seeing that somewhat in the UK, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Laura. It's great. <laughs> that is. No, thank you. Um, so we want to uh, bring Chuck in right now, but just quickly, I just want to go back to Alexandre for a second, uh, because Alexandre, the anti-scab legislation, can you just quickly tell people exactly how that would work? And the reason I ask that is, again, you know, full disclosure, I, I was a I was on strike. I was a federal public servant. 
And we heard, we heard interviews afterwards with um, a scab saying, who broke the, broke the cricket line, the whole bit. So I'm just kind of curious, how, how would it work exactly? Well, if you look at the uh, Quebec provincial legislation and the BC legislation, is something that we are looking to uh, implement at the federal level. So all the workers in the, in the federal sectors, we're talking about telecommunication, we're talking about uh, ports, uh, airplanes, uh, uh, trains. That's a big one. Um, you know, if you go uh, if you go on strike, the 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 company cannot hire somebody to do your job. It's just forbidden it's just illegal and you have uh processes to uh call inspectors to make sure that it's not the case if they are trying to do it uh what we want to be sure that it is in the legislation is the notion of uh because we are on the on zoom and facebook live uh in some jobs uh, sometimes you can do it from home with your computer or your cell phone. So we, we want to be sure that online work is included in the definition of replacement uh, workers. Because otherwise, in some sectors, can you imagine telecommunications, uh, you know, then yeah, the, the right to strike uh, means nothing. And, um, be, and right now at the federal level, it's really on balance because if you can hire people to replace workers that are on strike, which is the case right now at the port of Quebec, and what was the case in a, uh, um, a maritime company called Océan in Sorel, and uh, scabs were there, they were hired, and uh, they were paid three times what the workers on strike were asking for in their ne negotiations. It was deliberately an attempt to break the, the local union. It was a steelworker uh, local uh, for Océan Maritime. And uh, that would be uh, just uh, just illegal. And it's, you know, it forced the employer to negotiate in good faith. And, and most of the time, the strikes or the lockouts are shorter and with less violence because uh, it, the balance on the negotiating table is, uh, is there. About... PSAC uh, uh, strike, it's a little bit different because uh, there's a different legislation for uh, public servants. So we want to be sure that um, the law will include also uh, federal employees and public servants because otherwise it's just going to be uh, uh, private sectors and we don't want that. Gotcha. Okay, no, thank you for that clarification. Mm. Um, all right, Ch Chuka. Um, Given what we've heard about the challenges being faced by the labor movement, both nationally and locally, do you see signs of broader alliances and solidarity? And I'm saying either like good signs on the left or bad signs on the right. And I say that because in our December off the Hill panel, you mentioned that the, polit the political right sometimes benefits from social, economic and political disruption. So yeah, so um, of, yeah, I think of course, anytime uh, the far right will ex will exploit any uh, any crisis or upheaval to advance their ends, but I don't, wouldn't say or I don't know that unions are a priority organizing target for the far right. Um, regarding regarding what I just referred to, them exploiting disasters and whatnot, I was more referring to the sort of thing that was reported about a week ago in Grist, which is um, about far right militias masquerading as disaster response groups. Uh, in in a in service of propagandizing about white nationalized white nationalism, so they are explicitly organizing as disaster response groups in service of that. So it's a very obviously response to a crisis. Um, I don't I don't obviously you know on the topic of solidarity, I think that there are such indications. Um, the example in Ontario, I think, is incredibly encouraging. Not just uh, what happened with the teachers, but also the forthcoming "Enough is Enough" day that the OFL is, is sponsoring and sort of uh, um, organizing in service of. Um, I think that ad additionally, the sort of persistence and prominence of labor stories in the news, I think, keeps the issue kind of top of mind for people who don't interact with it directly. Um, you know, there's labor stories and uh, frequently in the news from Canada, from the U.S., from France, from the U.K. Um, and a lot of these are, you know, the, the union striking for the first time in 70 years and in 100 years sometimes. And I think that or my estimation would be that if somebody reads that a union is striking for the first time in decades, I don't think their immediate reaction is that the workers are being unreasonable. Um, but overall, I think that this is, I think there's, at very least, there's an option or there's an opportunity to, to, to 
organize in service of a really compelling kind of solidarity. I think that, you know, the, the crisis of neoliberalism is reaching a flashpoint. And speaking of the of the labor movement, I think there's a growing contingent within it that is in, in favor of explicit conflict with capital, explicitly acting against owners, uh, uh, profiteers, um, acting against collected interests and hoarded wealth. And so um, I think that, you know, insofar as the labor movement has taken up those politics in past eras and throughout, uh, you know, in the in the post Moroni, post Reagan era, post Thatcher and whatnot, uh, that has sort of fallen away from political discourse across the board. I think that there is support for that, both within the labor movement and increasingly within the public. There are a lot of people who have those ideas, who have those sentiments, but aren't part of a union um, because it has been so decimated within society. Um, oh, and I did want to make one point just about uh, AI. There actually are 150 workers in Nairobi that uh, work for ChatGPT that are unionizing right now. Um, and what they've been sub subjected to is horrific. They were forced, well, their job, they were paid, I think, think, you know, to two dollars or something like that an hour just pitiful uh, or, or deplorably low wages to sift through the 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 input sets of content that the the you know the owners of chat gbt or the 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 business that, that is you know making it available they were these workers had to sift through the content throughout the internet that was being input into this machine to attempt to uh, train it on various you know language models and all of that and they were they managed Manually remove the things that were too racist, too misogynistic, too violent, things like that. So they had to comb through the worst aspects of the internet day after day, hour after hour, and were paid, uh, you know, horrifically low wages for it. And so um, it is a it's a disgusting practice, a disgusting um, uh, business, in my opinion. And it's it's exciting that the workers are unionizing. Oh, looks like Libby might be freezing there again. If she comes back, she can continue, but I'll, we're going over to Carl now. Um, Fantastic to hear. Oh. And I, I guess I want to sort of move a little bit to um, over to Carl, because what we try to do is also connect that activism to how that plays out in parliamentary politics, right? In, in, in the political world on Parliament Hill. So over to you now, Carl. Um, and I guess what I want to ask you is, what influence does organized labor have on the political agenda in Ottawa? Now, in the past, we've seen big campaigns to bring in, for example, anti-scab legislation, which we, we talked about earlier. We've seen other campaigns around uh, fair wages and establishing a minimum federal wage. Um, so I guess the question is, are labor issues something that parliament pays attention to? And on today's Parliament Hill, who is fighting for labor and workers, worker rights? How is that playing out? So, Carl, just your thoughts on that. Well, well to start with, we have Alexandre here on the panel, so I, have, I can't say that his party is not fighting for labor and uh, mm -hmm. worker rights. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously the original uh, CCF going way, way, way back into the 30s and, and later on uh, was in favor of uh, workers and unions uh, at a time when it wasn't uh, that popular and it wasn't that widely accepted. And then uh, uh, the NDP was started as, as a, a, a joint project of the Canadian Labour Congress and the uh, old CCF. So it was a labor-based uh, party uh, from the beginning. I would say that people should bear in mind that when the NDP forms a government provincially, uh, as they did in Ontario for a while at one time, and as they are now in British Columbia, they sometimes uh, resemble a little bit the Liberal Party that's now in, in power in Ottawa in that they're hypothetically and theoretically and sentimentally in favor of labor, but then when they get into a particular negotiation with a particular group of workers, they are the managers and they also feel that they have to represent uh, the management side of the uh, argument and there are inevitable tensions and conflicts. So in this, uh, in, the, in the current government, uh, I mean, we had an interesting incident at Rabble when Patty Hyde was the Minister of Labor. She was Minister of Labor a few years back, and she's she's uh, she was that was her first job in this uh, cabinet, and she's kind of jumped quickly to a bunch of other positions. But she made a point of uh, of writing an article. The only time I've seen a Liberal cabinet minister all the time I've been involved in Rabble write to Rabble and say I'd like a an article published in Rabble 
because she wanted to reach out to Rabble's readers. And she thought a lot of union activists read Rabble or are involved with Rabble. And she wanted to essentially boast that the government was passing pro-labor legislation. In particular, she wanted to boast that uh, the government was finally adopting what they call the International Labor Organization's um, Resolution 98. That's very technical. The International Labor Organization is the United Nations body, similar to the World Health Organization, that looks after and takes that tries to organize around labor rights. And um, that art, that particular resolution pre uh, prevents governments or it conjoins go enjoins governments and the private employers not to penalize people to fire somebody, say, to put it simply, to fire a person who starts organizing a union as, as organizations like the fast food companies and people like Starbucks try to do, um, or, or to uh, uh, tell somebody they, 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 they can't have a job if they, if they want to join the union. That sort of, it, in other words, there should be no sanction against the person for union activism or for being a member of a union. So Patty Heide was very proud of writing this article and she, she, we Rabble published it. At the same time, around the same time, I and other people were writing about how the liberals had made a big point of rolling back two very uh, toxic pieces of Harper legislation um, that were attacked labor. That was one that imposed huge reporting requirements uh, on labor that businesses don't have. Huge multi-billionaire businesses don't have to, didn't have all these transparency and reporting requirements, but little labor unions with small amounts of money, they were going to, they were going to create this huge costly reporting requirements only because they hated labor. They particularly hated organized labor. And they also were going to make it very difficult to sign people up, they, I mean, we'll go into the technical details, but they were making it very difficult to card people and get people to join a union. So th this government got rid of that. I mean, this government did eliminate that. But then shortly after that, uh, there was a conflict with the postal workers and they brought in back to work legislation. So, uh, which was dubiously constitutional. We saw in Ontario that they, they didn't bother with the constitutional niceties of back to work legislation. They just said, Notwithstanding clause. So, <laughs> I mean, the Trudeau government wasn't about to invoke the notwithstanding clause, and they claimed that it was immune to the uh, to the constitu constitutional challenge. So uh, the government is is on all sides on all issues because it's the government, the current federal government, that really wants to be very cozy with the entrepreneurial class as well as the working class. If you look at the last budget. The last budget wants to put all kinds of money into alternate energy, environmental energy, clean energy, but it wants to do it via all kinds of tax breaks and tax benefits and tax expenditures and to work directly in partnership and get the, uh, the private entrepreneurs active. And a lot of these private entrepreneurs are pretty, I mean, they, they put in a provision that a lot of these measures must, they must have union labor. So that is good. On the other hand, there's all kinds of private entrepreneurs who they talk to and have lunch with and are lobbied by who are really uptight about unions because they feel that they give up control of their organization uh, if they have to share. They sort of say, the union is going to come in and start managing my shop, start managing my business. And what do they know about my business? I'm the one who knows about the business. So a government that wants to be friendly with big business at the same time, and especially cutting edge business, and also with the working classes all over the map. And the one group you see, they're, they're very slow about, they've promised for a long time to do something about migrant workers, and in particular, who are not citizens, who don't have permanent status. And then as well, another group we talk about, the, the, the um, gig, so-called gig workers. I'm very sensitive to this concept of gig workers. This is a word taken from professional musicians. This is a word that we adopted from musicians who would get one gig after another and never have any stable work. Now we apply it to computer engineers and all kinds of other people. And uh, we really don't see any action to enhance the rights of a very, very growing sector of the economy, the so-called gig economy. So we're all over the map and there's a big, big fight left. The good news I say for Canada is, aside from Italy, we have the highest rate of unionization among G7 countries, more than France, more than Germany, way more than the United States, also more than Spain, for instance, and many other countries. So uh, we have managed to keep the union movement relatively strong in Canada. Uh, Jim Stanford has written about this. And I think uh, I really, to see great heroes, not just working class heroes, 
but great Canadian heroes like Laura Walton getting the credit she deserves and getting the public profile she deserves and making and, and making unions heroic again is heartwarming and wonderful. Keep it up. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, thanks, yeah. Yeah, um, the uh, we want to give uh, Alexander a chance to Alexander. Is there anything you want to add to Carl's comments in terms of um, uh, the influence of organized labor on uh, the political agenda in Ottawa? Uh, yeah, it, it, it was uh, that was a great uh, general picture, and uh, it's true that the the liberals wants to show up like the best friends of uh, the labor, the labor movement and the workers. Uh, in political terms, uh, we are saying they tried to uh, to eat our lunch uh, uh, with the NDP, but at the same time, they have a lot of influence from big companies and private entrepreneurs. So they are they are sending mi mixed messages. And um, if I, I I can say something back to the anti-scab legislation, that there will be a link with that, is that. Uh, if we are pushing for a good legislation with uh, to to uh, cancel all the mistakes of the Quebec or the BC le provincial legislation, if we want to be sure that the online work is considered and and and, and illegal, on the other hand, Shima Sorigan is telling us, yeah, but you know we want the economy to continue to flow and to grow, even though there's a conflict, there's a strike or a lockout. So maybe we should talk about some kind of essential services to not to hurt the economy too much. So you, we are talking two different languages there. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm, I'm talking about the we are talking and Matthew Green and me and Charlie Angus talking about the rights of work of workers and bring balance at the negotiating table and and the, Shima Surigan and the Liberals are saying yeah but we don't want to hurt the economy we want to be sure that the goods and and the farmers will get their their, their products uh, continue to uh, go across Canada so uh, yeah so Carl is is, is right there's a Liberals are on, 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 on every side of, uh, of those issues uh, right now. And I, if I can say something about the tax e exemption for clean technology that was in the budget, I have a lot of critics about that because just alone, it's a gift for a lot of, of private companies. But the fact that there's links with those tax breaks with uh, good wage and, and unionized jobs is the work of the NDP in, in the parliament, and especially the work of Charlie Angus. And I was just want to be sure that it was out there. Thank you, Alexander. Um, all right, uh, Chuka, we're going to bring you back in. Um, things like the union grievance brought against the Canadian Human Rights Commission by the nine Black employees and the Black class action suit brought by Black federal uh, public servants against the government of Canada have focused attention on racism, particularly anti-Black racism in the federal public service. However, unions, like any organization, are not exempt from issues of racism and, racism and discrimination. What are your thoughts on this and what the unions are doing to address it? Um, I think that generally speaking, unions try to work against racism in workplaces and in their own institution, in their own structures. Obviously, there are areas that need improvement. Um, you know, notably, historically, unions were at first extremely racist. Um, but I think that it is at very least an issue that they recognize. And again, at very least, in some cases, are trying to address. However, I would argue that that really isn't enough at a time when we're seeing a horrific rise in fascism including both legislation and governance, and also a seemingly unending stream of Nazis and right-wing extremists committing uh, committing explicitly ideological mass murders. Um, I think that, the, that now the labor movement must be outwardly, actively anti-racist and anti-fascist. Um, I think that this means moving, so what I would say is moving further along the axis of internal and international solidarity upon which the labor movement already operates. I think it means loudly rejecting the disgusting anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ hate politics that is rising around us rejecting and opposing the assault on abortion rights and bodily autonomy, which, to be fair, a lot of unions have been vocal in doing. Um, 
means helping mobilize people when there's protection needed for, for example, drag shows or um, uh, school board meetings or any of the other incredibly normal things that right extreme right wingers have decided to target for uh, for mobilization. Um, I think it means acting similarly against the racist anti-immigrant politics we're also seeing and against the dehumanization of unhoused people. I think it also the, I think it also means vocally rejecting police associations, rejecting prison guard associations, and other organizations who participate in dem demonstrated structures of social murder, right? Things that we know are facets of how society deals with and ultimately eliminates people it does not want to provide for. Um, and I think that there's it also means a commitment to international solidarity that demands material equity for everyone on the planet. I mean, think for a second about Canada's position on COVID, on waiving IP restrictions for COVID-19 vaccines. Canada su supported the pharmaceutical companies and, in, and defended IP restrictions in the context of a years long and ongoing uh, uh, global public health crisis. I don't think that that can be described as anything other than disgusting racism and inhumanity justified through the vulgarity of nationalism. I think that unions have to be vocal in rejecting those sorts of decisions made by the government and that kind of thinking. Um, we condemn that sort of access to well-being that it can we condemn that access to well-being can be so disparate across postal codes we should do the same for national borders because it fundamentally is the same thing we know how this inequity was created we know the process of centuries by which well-being is access to well-being is uh, uh, made available to particular people in the world and not to others we cannot abide it any longer um, i think that gun governments trust must be forced by mass mobilization to participate in global equity and a general strike for example cannot happen without the labor movement it's only with the support and protection of their unions that that uh, workers can can take radical action, which recognizes that climate inequity is on the scale of genocide. The, the death that will result from climate inequity is on the scale of genocide, and it is being spurred by the fossil fuel industry and the, financi and the financial sector and being enforced by border guards and standing militaries. Unions, pe people want to reject these things. You, workers want to reject these things. Further organizing can increase the, the, the population of people who do, but that cannot happen without the protection and organization of unions and labor and labor uh, networks. Um, the same thing happens for, or the same thing can be said of shipping weapons sold by the Canadian government to be used in war crimes, crimes against humanity, and apartheid. Workers cannot oppose these things without the support and protection of their unions. Yeah. Um, I, th I think, last thing I'll say very quickly, uh, the fundamental premise of the labor movement is that everybody deserves to live a decent life. A life lived at the expense of another is not a decent life. Yeah, thank you very much, Chuka, and that's a very... Yeah. Fulsome um, answer, and I, 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 we've got time for one question, um, and the question really focuses on something that Alexander raised, and that is the current Minister of Labour, Shaman Regas, and you know how he's sort of touting the idea that there should be, you know, uh, essential services at the same time that they purport to uh, support labour rights. So the question is. What needs to be done to put labor issues front and center as key economic issues for Canadians and those in elected office? But I want to just offer to the panel that given Chuka's just uh, amazing uh, overview just now of what the unions need to be doing overall, free feel, feel free to comment on that. You don't all have to you know, sort of weigh in on economic issues as labor issues. If you want to follow up on something that Chuka said as well, please feel free to do that. So Laura, why don't we begin with you with just some uh, just some thoughts and, and follow up based on, on the last uh, bit of discussion we've had? You know, I think the way that we keep labor issues front and center is by talking beyond our spaces and opening those spaces up. And as a wise uh, sister uh, taught me just this spring, you know, it isn't about building a bigger table. It's about getting rid of the table completely and starting over. Um, like we have to recognize that union spaces are, you know, sometimes, well, not sometimes, routinely still very colonial spaces. Um, and so we have to dismantle that. And part of that begins when we start talking and centering workers and communities in our fights. 
what do folks need, right? And listening to that and then empowering them to make that change. Um, and I think when you keep doing that, when you keep talking in your community, when you keep listening in your community, when you start acting on what people are bringing forward as these are my real issues, that's how you keep labor front and center. That's how you ensure that the elected officials are paying attention to you. Change does not come from a place of comfort. And so we're going to have to get uncomfortable and recognize the role that we all play in this and how do we demand better. Um, and that it comes through. And, you know, I say it time and again, solidarity is a verb. It's not a statement, it's an action. Uh, and you have to bring, you know, there was an excellent um, emergency resolution that was passed, just building off of what Chucko was saying in regards to the hate that is happening in our school boards and public libraries. Um, you know, there was a resolution passed at the CLC to create anti-fly squads. We have to bring the words of, on those resolution papers to life within our communities. There's no sense going and saying, oh, well, we passed this and we're all in favor and then saying, okay, job well done. No, we need to bring it to life and we need to take a lead in the labor movement and say, we can be the leader. When the elected officials are not doing what you as you know, a community need, labor needs to be that answer in providing that space and that voice for people to be able to you know, show their power and take back their power from the elected officials. Uh, the, you know, the power of the people is always stronger than the people in power. And we just have to continuously remember that and be pushing that forward as we go. Thanks, Laura. We've just got a couple minutes left before we go to questions. So I'd just like to invite um, others on the panel, uh, Alexandra or Carl or Chuka to, to weigh in on just what this sort of looking forward role is in terms of economic issues for the labor movement, but also the role of unions generally. Uh, anybody yeah. else like to weigh in? Alexandria? Yeah. yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks to be quickly, you know, um, I think there's a big role for labor, labor union in our political uh, discussion in our democracy in general. You know, Carl was talking earlier about anti-union legislation from the Harper government. One of them was uh, full transparency. You know, can you imagine that you, you have your strike fund, the money you have in your strike fund is public. So you, the, 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 the employer knows exactly when you will get out of <laughs> out of money it's it's ridiculous and who was defending those legislation in the harper government libya i know that you know it was pierre, Poly pierre poliev mm -hmm. and when right now i see that in the polls that members of a union in the private sector their first choice is pierre poliev conservatives labor movement has an important role to remind people those facts and say those guys are not your friend. They're not, they're not defending your interests. They are not defending your organization because otherwise we will have a really big, bad surprise uh, maybe in the next federal election. So uh, the labor union, they have to, to strike back. They have to tell the truth and to remind their own members and the public in general what, what we are facing right now. Absolutely. And Carl, any, any final thoughts from you on this? I'm just struck by the whole issue. I was really, really struck to see the rallying behind QP to see the five unions or most of them who had supported Ford in the election just a few months, early, months earlier turn up, not just sit on their hands and not just quietly call them up and saying, uh, we're not so sure about this, Doug, but actually just turn up and stand on the podium and say, this is wrong. So, I mean, it took that kind of crisis to show them that they... Uh, you know, they put their pillow on the wrong bed uh, somehow, you know, that their shoes are under the wrong doorway. But, uh, you know, when you saw when you saw uh, when you see um, there's been a long standing, you know, somewhat some some sort of split, not exactly split, but difference between private sector unions and you, especially the male dominated old line industrials type of construction unions and public sector unions uh, in, in, for the kinds of workers who Laura represents and to find a way not, not to wait for the next crisis, but to find a way to build a strong, strong partnership between these groups. We need the private sector unions and the public sector unions to see that they have common interests and find a way that they have common interests because the, I mean, the people who are, you would hear expressing support for um, uh, Pierre Poiliev in um, uh, generally, if they're union members, 
are in the private on the private sector union side, mm -hmm. and uh, you know some of those people uh, get the imprint. They, they the, you know the the kind of cheap populist rhetoric gets to them. I think it's in something to do with vaccines or uh, who knows what it is, but the, but it's but it is a genuine communications and cultural issue that uh, I think the labor movement has to uh, has to uh, confront. Thanks, thanks, yeah, Carl. And thanks, Carl. Uh, Chuka, just any last comment from you before we go to questions? No, I think they. Uh, okay. Yeah, I All right. Questions. Back over to you, Robin. Great. Thanks, Libby. And thanks to uh, all, all uh, to everybody for another great discussion. And uh, Laura, thanks to the for you for that. I'm going to get a T-shirt with that slogan on there. The power of the people is always more than the people in power. Yes. <laughs> Put that on a T-shirt and sell that as uh, as off uh, uh, off the hill merch. Um. All right, so now we're going to get into some audience questions. Um, and uh, here's the first one. And it is from uh, Karen Markle's asking, uh, actually, sorry, wrong question. They, sorry, they said, is this, Lee's is worried, uh, are you worried that labor may lose some, uh, some of its power with people uh, working remotely? Does it make it harder to organize? So, um, Maybe if we're let's let's start with uh, Alexandre, and we'll go to Laura. Alexandre, what do you think? That's a great question, and the uh, sadly the answer is uh, is yes, it's harder. It's uh, it's it's way easier when you have uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, workers on this at the same place, because you have those discussions. It's it's organic. You you can feel the energy and the fact that together you can achieve things and defend your rights and and progress and increase your uh, working conditions or living conditions. When you are isolated, it's much more difficult. So with all the new uh, economy, uh, people uh, making a. Uh, uh, translations or uh, making uh, part of the video games from their 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 office, but the office is in their home, in the house. It's much more difficult to feel this um, solidarity and, and energy. So that's that's a, a challenge, of course. Yes. Thanks, Laura. I saw you. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree. Uh, I think we first of all need to acknowledge that organizing in general is hard. There are no shortcuts in organizing. There's no easy way out. You know, we make a joke all the time that if organizing was easy, the government would already have outlawed it. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard work. Um, and But I can only speak from our personal experience. We began our, you know, hardcore grassroots organizing in the midst of a pandemic when workers were remote, 55,000 workers across the province were remote. We weren't in our schools. We weren't even allowed to go in and, and gather in schools. Um, but you have to seize the opportunities as they present themselves and make them their own. Um, you know, now we know that we can do webinars on Zoom. We can do drop-ins on Zoom. We utilized, um, you know, things like Call Hub to do one-on-one -on -one conversations on, by phone. Um, you have to find ways. And I think, you know, there are always going to be obstacles when you're organizing, but you have to find ways to break through those obstacles and make sure that you are including workers and putting them in the in center in the fight. Um, and so, yeah, you know, there are, you know, other, there are things that are more difficult, but at the same time, when they're working remotely, they don't have the boss glaring at them all the time either. Um, and so like, you just, you have to figure out ways to make this work um, and think outside of the box. We've got to stop this. Oh, this is the way we've always done it and recognize that we have to find new ways to connect. Um, and we really need to be looking at young workers who are really, you know, on the cutting, you know, they're really making new pathways for all of us on how to connect in ways that I, like they brought things like TikTok to me and I'm like, you've got to be joking. I don't foresee myself on this, but it is a way to connect with workers. Uh, so I don't think that it's any harder. I think that all organizing is hard, but it is probably one of the most worthwhile things that I've ever done in my career and will continue to do. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, if I may, I think as well that uh, remote work is also incredibly uh, uh, an incredibly radicalizing event. Um, you know, employers said you have to be here 
And workers said, no, that's, I mean, that has been something that has just been baked into the labor market for decades now. Um, so it politicizes literally where you get to be in the world in given times for the majority of your waking life for, in, for most of us. Um, but it also politicizes a kind of spatial and physiological inequity that exists in the labor market in that not everybody has the ability to do remote work given both their labor um, or, or some people or the sort of demands of their immediate home environment. So I think that it's like, I think the more that the, the more that these sort of the, the these dimensions of inequity, dimensions of employer and profiteer domination of our lives, dimension of sort of capitalist, the, the degree to which the, the functioning of capitalism is a system which enriches a very small amount of people and at the expense of literally all other life on the planet, the, the degree to which those, the, the, the degree to which we can problematize how much we've been conditioned to accept the structures of that system, I think is positive. Of course, you know, there are challenges to, to people not being in the, the same place, but uh, employers generally prohibit you in a collective agreement that generally prohibit you from doing any um, union work on employer time. So obviously it happens anyway, but, uh, but it is something that even if you were in the same place working, ostensibly you wouldn't be permitted, in most cases you wouldn't be permitted to, to discuss uh, your, your, your concerns, at least not officially as a union. Yeah, no, no, thank you very much. Um, all right. Um... My next question um, is from Heather Walker. She's asking, uh, what can we do to support temporary foreign workers and can, uh, and can we eliminate the abuse they face? So I guess that would be the we in terms of people, but also the, the government. So let's go, um, um, actually, maybe we'll pick up again right with Chuka and then go to Carl on this. Well, yeah, well, I think there's two things. One, obviously, the laws in this country have to be changed. Um, it is it is in this country, like in a lot of uh, wealthy industrialized countries, uh, hand harvesting is a job that generally people born in the country don't want to do, even when those jobs are available, even when explicitly there are programs made to, to hire people born to, in the country, they don't take them. So it's something that countries know ex intentionally, explicitly and, and consciously rely upon migrant workers for. So obviously, the, the laws in this country need to be changed to ensure that their rights are respected, they have immediate access to citizenship, should they, should they so choose it, that they, they are not they're not uh, um, made to live in the site that they are working. They don't have to live in housing, you know, quote unquote housing that their uh, that their employer owns all like the condition there has to be overhaul of the sector and then severe penalties for violations um, because these violations are violations of human rights, but also it cannot be the case that people in the world, anywhere in the world, feel compelled to leave where they are, to leave their home in pursuit of economic opportunity. That allows people to be exploited by migrant worker programs. So if we care about this issue, we have to also support economic empowerment and equity everywhere in the world so that nobody feels compelled to, to so nobody is forced to put themselves in a position where they can be exploited in such a way. And Canada absolutely does not support global empowerment and equity. It actively opposes it in its interventions in global deliberations in the IMF and in the UN. Thank you, Chuka. Carl, do you want to add to that? You're, you're on mute, Carl. I sound much better on mute. I know. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't speak as quickly. So all I can say is that I once wrote an article where I talked about uh, the government pussyfoot, you know, like very soft peddling the no notion of a path to a permanent residency for temporary foreign workers. And the people who represented those people uh, took great umbrage. They said, we're not talking about a path to permanent residency. We're talking about bringing people in, everybody treated the same. If you're bringing somebody in to harvest agriculture products or if you're bringing somebody in to be a brain surgeon, that's the same. You know, that's the same. They, they have the same rights. It's the same system. So essentially, uh, we're talking about abolishing the ghetto, the separate the separate second class or third class or fourth class status that a temporary foreign worker has compared to a person who comes in comes into Canada um, as a so-called regular uh, immigrant and putting them all on the same uh, footing. But our economy is really become hugely dependent on this 
uh, class of guest workers, as they call them in Europe, or migrant workers, or temporary foreign workers. Uh, it was vastly expanded by the Harper government, but this government uh, is reluctant federally to take it on because they'd run into problems, the, the provinces uh, like it because of very important sectors in their economy, and not just agriculture, but other sectors have become addicted to this easily manipulated uh, and uh, uh, a, a class of workers who essentially have no rights so that it can be uh, uh, pushed around and, and squeezed uh, as hard as you want to squeeze them. I mean, we just have to essentially end that system and uh, uh, force employers uh, to treat everybody uh, mm -hmm. as though they're permanent, as permanent residents of Canada who have all the rights of a permanent resident. You can't, you can't become a Canadian citizen the day after you arrive here, but as a permanent resident, you do have, you are covered, you essentially have many of the rights of a citizen. For instance, you have full mobility rights. You can't be forced uh, to live in, you know, to work for one employer and then not be able to move. I mean, one one group, another group of temporary workers in a similar situation are domestic workers, people who come in as nannies and and uh, and that sort of thing, who are tied to a family that exploits them, tied to two people uh, who exploit them. And you see them walking around the, the the streets of our big cities. You know, and I'm I'm afraid that our that our liberation as professional parents can't depend on the exploitation of somebody who's left their whole family in the Philippines and comes here and has no rights and can't even leave or take another job. I'm really sorry that I, I completely jumped off the call there. We lost power at our house. Don't know why. And I keep freezing. So, but I'm back, but I know we're just near the last few minutes, but sorry for my disappearance. <laughs> quite all right. Quite all right. Um, yeah, we are near the end. So we have one last audience question. So this, this will be kind of like the, uh, the, 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 the quick firing round here. We'll go through quickly, but it's a good question. So Karen Merkel is asking, is there a labor shortage? And if so, What's causing it? Is it did COVID take a lot of people out of the workforce? Uh, and are people no longer willing to put up with low wages? So that's a lot in there. <laughs> but, but quick answers. Let's go with we'll go with Laura, Alex, uh, Carl, and Chuko and up. I think, yes, there are some folks that did leave the labor market. I, I'm not going to discount that. We know that there was a significant drop in women working in the labor in the workforce uh, during COVID. But I think it's more that people are done taking crappy wages uh, and in, in employers not recognizing that labor has value. Um, and, you know, it's it's slowly we're starting to see a change. Um, in wages that are being negotiated, um, but those are in unionized spaces. Let's remember there are a lot of ununionized workers that need some supports as well um, in order to change the labor market as well. So I think, you know, for me personally, I think it is just a lot of bad bosses wanting to continue to suppress, you know, wages instead of recognizing that the labor that they depend on to make money also has, you know, a value and a worth and needs to be paid more. Thank you. Alex. Yeah, about labor shortage, I agree with, uh, with Laura. It's like, you know, uh, offer better conditions and better wages. Suddenly, you will have per person and uh, workers interested in your in your job. If 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 it's uh, crappy conditions, they will look at uh, other uh, at other places. That's it. That's all. I just want to outline something about temporary mig migrant workers, which is funny. In that expression is temporary. I met a lot of them, and they are working here since six years, seven years, eight years, without seeing their family and children in their own original countries. And they are still there working two, three jobs, no status, no rights, no protection at all. And uh, it, this is pure capitalism. And uh, this is why uh, we, 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 we want them to have automatically their permanent residency, but also to change the rules and to improve their, wor their working condition. Uh, other, otherwise, it's like modern slavery. That's it. Thank you. Carl, quickly and Chuka, quickly. And we'll I mean, just, just one, but one point, not to disagree with what we just heard about a labor shortage, uh, but it is true that we have a somewhat aging uh, Canadian population were it not for uh, immigration as a part of the aging group. And maybe one issue is that there, um, and that some 
but older part, part of, uh, sections of the workforce are continuing to work longer, but that there is a, uh, a notion that we can't adapt, to speak for my own generational cohort, that we can't adapt workplace conditions so that people who want to continue working longer can do it so they have some kind of uh, balance. It shouldn't be negative incentives saying, we'll give you less in the way of pensions and less in the way of benefits and less in the way of social supports or less in the way of medical supports. It should be some kind of flexible uh, arrangements that allow people who are older to continue to work, but maybe their needs are also uh, recognized uh, based on their age. Thank you. And last word, Shuka. Um, yeah, I mean, I just don't really know how to conceive of the concept of a, of a labor shortage in a society that thinks gambling, gambling on stocks to maximize profit, no matter how many people's lives you destroy, counts as work. Um, we have not done a meaningful accounting of what work what work actually is required to provide for everyone's well-being. So to say that we have a labor shortage, it's, I mean, what are you talking about? Thank you for that. Thank you, uh, everybody. That is all the time we have today. Um, thank you to Alexander Bolaris, Laura Walton, Chuka Jacob, and Carl Nuremberg. Our live political panel off the Hill will return on June 21st. Be sure to get an invitation for that event by signing up for Rabble's newsletter at rabble.ca slash subscribe. And finally, as always, we want to encourage everyone who registered for tonight's event to consider making a donation to Rabble, because giving a monthly sustaining donation helps support great live events like this in the future. And you can make a one-time donation or become a monthly donor at rabble.ca slash donate. So thank you all very much for joining us tonight and see you on uh, June 21st. Thanks, Robin, and hope to see everybody June 21st as well.